So I'm old enough and I've been doing jiu-jitsu long enough to remember a time when there were almost no constraints on leg locks when you were competing with the gi. You could, you could not do heel hooks, but other than that, you could do ankle locks, you could do knee bars, you could do anything, and you could do it the, the most effective ways. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, things have changed since then, but people are still competing yep. under the modern IBGF uh, rule system, yep. and they still want to do leg locks. So I thought today I'd pick your brain, and we'd talk, and we'd see about the leg locks that are legal in IBGF competition. We'll talk about when they're legal, yep. show people the basic, simplest way to do one of them. Yep. And we'll uh, then talk about a couple outlier attacks like the Estima Lock. Absolutely. Yeah. So this would be what I would term the, if you want to do a completely castrated version of leg locks, here it is. Uh, because like you said, the most effective uh, submission, the heel hook, is banned. And one of the most effective ways of controlling a leg entanglement, which is referred to as a reap, is banned. So maybe just show them very, very quickly, because we but, don't know how advanced people are, what a heel hook is, yeah. and what a reef is. Yeah. And this, we're not going to be showing you any more about this today. Right. So a heel hook would be any time I can expose the heel to hook it with my forearm, my other forearm. There's a bunch of different variations on this. Basically the idea is I'm trapping your foot and creating a lever out of it so that I can create rotation. So that's a heel hook. And then a reap is an imaginary thing where any time I do this, your knee explodes. Uh, at least so we've been told. So literally any time my foot crosses this line, I'm reaping. Uh, the idea being that it, you know, it forces your knee to turn. Right. Um, so yeah. okay. those are the two things that have created a, a truncation of any potential effectiveness in leg locks in the IBJJF. Okay, so let's start with the ankle lock, yep. uh, which is one of the locks that's still legal as yep. long as you don't reap. Exactly, yeah, and the ankle lock, the straight ankle lock, is legal at all levels. You are allowed to pursue it at white belt. Uh, the um, Adult division. Adult division, yes, yeah, sorry. I have no idea how the kids' divisions work. I'm grateful to not have to teach children. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the, yeah, the, at, in the adult division at white belt, you can pursue a straight ankle lock. So let's start to go through that. Uh, so you, you can entangle the legs, and you know, we refer to a standard ashy. Um, one thing to be aware of in IBJJF is if I am attacking a straight ankle lock to this side and my partner turns this way, I have to let go. Again, kind of a silly rule. I, I, I personally don't, I, I, I have never heard a good explanation for really any of these things. But uh, the idea is that when I'm here, I can finish. And as soon as it turns that way, his knee is in some major jeopardy for some reason, which again, is completely untrue. And your heel cannot start it can't, Yeah, you can never do that. And no matter what, like, you know, again, what, what, literally, what changed between this and this in terms of the pressure on your knee? Not a single thing. If anything, this is dangerous to me, because if we were right. doing heel hooks, yeah. I could actually be hurt. But anyway, my heel stays on your hip line. It does not cross the midline of your body. All right, so this would be the you know, legal at every level, and frankly, still a, a pretty good submission. Uh, if we just go through a, a couple of the, like, the, the basic concepts that we want to use here. First thing I want to do is control your hip. I want to be immobilizing your hip, preferably with some sort of pinning pressure. Ideally with my shin driving in. I'm always trying to avoid my partner's nuts when I'm driving this pressure in. But, you know, it'll happen sometimes. But And then my foot is blocking. And a, a, another pretty important detail here is if I can, which not everyone can, but if I can place the ball of my foot on the ground when we're doing this, it's going to create a much stronger frame. If my foot is just here like this, the, the lever access is much greater for Stefan. So ideally, my shin is driving in, my heel is curling in, my foot is on the hip, and I'm putting the ball of my foot on the ground. I'll be up on my elbow as I'm trying to establish the grip. Right? Once I've done all this, assuming that I can keep Stefan kind of pinned in place, you'll notice that, uh, you may not notice, but I am pushing him away a little bit in this case. This isn't something that I would necessarily want to do with some other submissions, but with the straight foot lock, definitely. And ideally, if I can release your foot, my forearm is going to slide back until it hits the, the, the juncture where the Achilles tendon meets your actual heel bone. I want to slide back until I feel that, and I want to use you know, roughly the middle of my forearm to do this. I don't want, uh, or sorry, my wrist. I don't want the muscle of my forearm involved in this because a soft structure is going to have a harder time breaking a hard structure. So I want to be cutting into your Achilles tendon. And I'm on my elbow, and all I'm going to look to do now is bring my elbow back on an angle, which is going to start to create a bit of that inversion of the foot at the same time as I extend your body away. So I'm going to use my hand for base here. Normally my hand would be tightening this up, but just to sort of illustrate how powerful this movement can be, as I start to extend you away and turn, 
it's going to create that, uh, that pressure that's going to, again, once we've taken all the slack out of the joint and put all the pressure into the end of the lever, we have our most efficient braking mechanic. Okay. So that's your basic ankle lock, legal at all levels, adult. Exactly. If you're a kid, you should be watching YouTube. I'm sure it's in terms of service somewhere. Yeah, so. there you go. <laughs> okay, next leg lock. Right, so the next leg, now we have to kind of skip ahead. Uh, basically, until you're a brown belt, you're not allowed to do any other leg locks. Uh, there is one potential exception to this, and we'll cover that afterwards, called the esteem lock. Um, so the, the next leg locks would be the knee bar, the toe hold, and the, the calf slicer, which is of limited use. So the knee bar, depending on how you get here, you're going to end up facing your partner's knee with your hips, and you're going to end up extending this leg. So again, all of those ingredients that we talk about conceptually in our uh, you know, leg lock formula stuff, I want to be immobilizing the hips, so I'm going to make sure that I'm curling my leg in, because if my legs are straightened out here, there's a bunch of play in Stefan's hip, it's gonna act as a shock absorber. So I'm curling in, and I wanna make sure that my thighs are not quite, one slightly above the other, so I'm creating a good wedge mechanic here. And I wanna be right at his knee. I don't wanna be really close to his hip, because there's gonna be, again, a bunch of play in your knee, so I wanna immobilize the knee as much as I can. And then I'm gonna be controlling the heel here, which is the source of the lever, and I'm gonna be controlling, the, you know, again, what I incorrectly call the bunion, here with my neck or my head, it kind of depends how tall I am relative to the length of my partner's legs. And I'm gonna be rotating the heel up. Right? As I do that, again, same as with all the other leg locks and frankly joint locks, I need to take the slack out of the joint first. And that's not me bridging, again, it might seem like I'm bridging into Stefan's knee, I'm not actually doing that. I'm curling and I'm extending my body. I'm trying to make myself tall through my spine. It feels like my foot's being pulled away from my body. Exactly, like I'm literally trying to rip your leg out of your hip. I obviously can't do that, but that's the, that's the nature of the motion. It's straight up. And then once I've taken all the slack out of the joint and I don't feel like I can go any further, then I apply rotation on the heel and downward pressure. Only then do I start to hip in. The hipping in is the last thing you should do. You save that. It's a big energy expenditure. You save it for when you've taken all that slack out of the joint uh, and all of the ligaments, all the, the cartilage, everything's stretched to its maximum capacity to, uh, to undergo or, or to withstand pressure. So we want our maximum pressure against the weakest possible structure of the leg. Now with the rotational control there that you're establishing using your face and the heel, yeah. have you run into any problems or heard of any problems of getting dinged for applying a heel hook from a weird, or twisting leg lock from a weird direction? You know, I have not, but now that this video is out there and, you know, and, and, and more and more information is getting out there about the rotational nature uh, of a lot of leg locks and how they can be made more powerful that way. <laughs> okay. you know, you I'm so okay. sorry if I just ruined your chance of knee barring or something. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, you do need to establish rotational control. Absolutely. Way, Otherwise, he's just going to turn, right? right? And one of the things, you know, this will kind of, uh, you know, segue a little bit. One of the things that I can immediately do when that happens is try to go for a toe hold. Right. Uh, now, unfortunately, as soon as so, you Rob, complete... what's a toe hold? <laughs> right. A toe hold is where I'm gripping the toes to create a bend in the foot. Now, we're not necessarily going to do it this way because if somebody keeps turning that way, all of a sudden I'm reaping. Oh, and my knee I, I've got to let go. Right? So we want to be really careful about how we're applying the toe hold in IBJJF. Uh, as long as I'm facing your hips and I'm trying to apply the pressure here, I'm generally okay. But if at any point this sort of thing were to happen, I was still like, right now, as, as far as I know, we're okay as long as I'm not touching your foot. And again, this is kind of the problem with the IBJJF rules is they're so labyrinthine and Byzantine that sometimes some things that you would think are like, as long as I'm not touching your foot, there's no, this should be fine, but I know some people would call this a reap at this point. The same way that I know that some people will call the 411 legal as long as I'm not touching this foot, and as soon as I touch it, it's a reap and it's illegal. All right, so I steer clear of it. Yeah, I, exactly. I, I try to really steer clear of, like, basically attack the straight foot lock, attack the knee bar, and you can attack the toe hold if you're in what we would call outside ashy, right? So I can attack the toe hold from here because there's no risk of a reap. If I find myself in this position, I'm kind of, I'm not quite over enough to attack the knee bar, but I can definitely make a grip. Again, we're always targeting that bunion because it's, or bunions or whatever you want to call them, because it's the end of the lever. So I'm gripping, I am going to use my thumb. I'm going to come around here, I'm going to use my thumb. And my goal, Again, this is contrary to how a lot of people teach it. This is contrary to how I originally learned it. But I am extremely fortunate to be able to train with Coyotera. 
and he showed me this, like his version of how to finish a foot lock or a toe hold, which is in my experience much, much more effective. It's it, a toe hold went from something I basically ignored and had no respect for in training to something I was really afraid of. Uh, and the idea is that I'm not driving the heel towards your butt, but I'm actually pulling laterally on your knee as I do it. So I'm pushing down the same structure that you would have seen in the past, which is the idea of raising this forearm and pushing the toes down, but I'm actually trying to move your leg this way against the side of your knee to create maximum pressure in your foot. Okay. So I'm not allowing the bending of your leg to create again that shock absorber effect. We're taking all the slack out of the joint. I'm pulling the leg away and then bringing it up to finish. Okay. So that's toe hold. That's toe hold. Ankle lock, knee bar, toe hold. Right. Now we've got calf slicers. Right. So for instance, if I were to find myself in the standard ashy and you happened to turn that way and I ended up here. This shin in the bend of your knee is going to create the potential for a calf slicer. Now, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, but basically, if I just get you to come back a little bit, just have, um, if I can grab your hip and drive forward, that's essentially what a calf slicer is. is I'm, uh, some people actually call this a knee separator, which is a really good, because like right now, I'm not really slicing Stefan's calf. My shin is actually in his hamstring. There are versions of this where I will have my leg entangled this way and my shin will actually be slicing into your calf. So this would be, again, another version of it. Again, I'm just driving my shin bone into the bend of your knee while I pull on the end of a lever and extend my hip. Um, this is not a fake submission. This can absolutely injure people. Uh, but in my experience with A, higher level people, and B, bendy, skinny people. You know, there are people who can very comfortably sit like this and it's really difficult to take their knee or their leg to a point where you're actually doing significant enough damage. Not that you can't do any damage, but significant enough damage to make someone tap in a higher level match. Yeah, it's maybe one of those things that works great in class, but doesn't work so great in competition. Absolutely, and you know, we've talked about this quite a bit in the past, the idea of tailoring your training around what works at the higher level because there's so many false positives in training. There are a lot of things that work when your training partner has a nine to five job and their main mission in life is not surviving uh, uh, you know, uh, the end of a match in jiu-jitsu to get a gold medal. They just don't care, and rightly so. You know, that's not me knocking anyone. That is the right thing to do. You should always tap early and often in training. And frankly, you should do the same in competition. Unless you're competing at an extremely high level where there's a lot of money on the line, there's no reason to risk your body. So a lot of us have a totally false sense of what is a submission. Like what is a real submission that would work in a fight against an adrenalized, trained, angry opponent? And the cast slicer is just not very high. class. Uh, in, with, with all the aids, the yeah. needles and lava and all that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you know, even in an MMA fight, you, you can find a few examples here and there of a cast slicer. There's a particular version that is uh, you know, a little bit more effective than some of the others. Uh, where you've got someone loaded up on top of you and you're holding their hips and you're bridging in, which I believe Charles Oliveira hit uh, in the UFC. But that's the only example I can think of uh, of an effectively applied calf slicer. So then the final lock we were going to talk about was the esteem lock. The esteem lock, yeah. So this is, again, when we talk we have, about we have, the, we have done a separate video on this. Yes, but let's just cover it again just with the idea of you know, talking about the IBJJF and legality and all that. So, you know, at brown belt and up, this is totally fine because regardless of whether, so when Stefan plays this with you, regardless of whether this is interpreted as an ankle lock or a toe hold, it's still legal at brown belt and up. So if you're brown belt, you're black belt, fill your boots, man. Like get in here, get underneath the ankle, create the lever with your abdomen, drop down, get your finish, it's all good. However, if you're a white belt, if you're a blue belt, if you're a purple belt, there are some refs that will view this as a straight ankle lock. They, like, they will just interpret this as you, let's just say you rotate your foot a little bit more that way. Yeah, they'll interpret this as you kind of, like if your foot were to get cut, yeah. They'll interpret this as you doing a straight ankle lock of some kind. And, which it's not. Which is not, no, like if we want to be honest, it's a twisting foot lock. Yeah. But, you know, some people think it's okay, some people think it isn't. Okay, so yeah. your recommendation to white belts, blue belts, and purple belts? Don't mess with it. Uh, I mean, mess with it in training. Get good at it. I mean, my recommendation to everybody is that the latest you should be starting to learn uh, leg locks is kind of, you know, partway into your blue belt. Uh, white, Agreed. Otherwise, you get to brown belt. And you suck at it. And you suck at it. Yeah. You're a full belt or two behind. Totally, totally. So uh, I, I think be yeah, a blue belt, even, even early blue belt is a good time to get started. Uh, I mean, I personally teach leg locks to my, you know, mid to advanced white belts, I get them started on it. Uh, but there's, 
There's no right answer for that. Like I, obviously these are just like, depending on what your goals are in training, you may not ever care about competing. You may be- More for guideline really. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So it, you know, it, it's uh, anything like, you know, when should you train this? When should you, tra should you train that? You know, some people really believe you should train with punches regularly. Some people, it doesn't matter. Do whatever makes you happy. But if your goal is to be a well-rounded grappler, A, B, if your goal is to ever compete, at a higher level, so you know, brown belt, black belt, or any kind of advanced no gi division. Especially nowadays, uh, you know, you, we can make the argument easily five or ten years ago that you could be a very high level and accomplished competitor and not have a good understanding of the leg lock game. That's just yeah. not true anymore. Now, if you want, and most to Abu Dhabi winners five or ten years ago didn't really have a. They were top level black belts at normal jiu jitsu. Yeah, and pretty. And good they, you know, and when you're good enough at normal jiu-jitsu, it takes an exceptional leg locker to really be able to threaten you, right? Like it took Dean Lister to come around and submit some of these guys for anyone to give any credence to the idea that leg locks could be effective right. at a high level. Nowadays, especially with the, the prevalence of no-gi, sub-only type competition, if you want to compete at any kind of high level, you absolutely have to start with this stuff at a pretty early stage in your development yeah. or you just will not catch up. Yeah, so even earlier if you do no-gi, but oh yeah. With with the gi, probably I would agree. Like by the time you're blue belt, you should have a basic idea. You should at the very to... least understand how to do the you know the standard ashi and the straight footlock, even if it's starting at white belt. You you should you absolutely got to know how to do that. Yeah. Right. And then, but the ones that are only legal brown belt and up, you know the, the knee bars should still be introduced. Yeah. Yeah. You should you should get to your purple belt and go. I've never really done a knee bar. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I I, I completely agree. Uh, again, there are. A large percentage of schools that totally disagree that you're absolutely not allowed to touch someone's feet until you're a brown belt. Um, and, you know, that's how they do it. Yeah. I will yeah. keep my mouth shut because I don't want to piss anybody else off. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've pissed off a significant percentage of my viewership already, so thank you for that uh, consideration. No worries.